Hey guys, uh, Lynn Burke here, uh, and with my good buddy Mike Soldano here at uh, Soldano Custom Amplification in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we're going to do something different with this video today. Um, Russ may pop in, Don may pop in. Work still in progress here every day. Um, actually, right now we're we're going to check out his uh, his custom cars he's had down there. He's been a lifelong a muscle car guy like me. Unfortunately, I'm in between cars right now, and we're actually in between cars here at Mike. But he's got what? Eight, nine, ten cars in here. We're going to kind of let him talk to you about uh, his passion, not only building things with his hands, but uh, his love of cars. And right now, <laughs> holding up my camera, uh, I'm, I've got it on the hood of his '66 Nova wagon. That's right. Yeah, '66 yeah. Nova wagon. So We're what's down it doing? Here in the hobby shop. Yeah, it's, it's holding up our camera today. So I'm going to let Mike. I'm going to uh, zoom in on Mike and let him tell you about some of these cars that have had a real big relationship with the amplifier side of the house as well. And then we're going to shoot another video uh, afterwards uh, about his fabrication techniques and some of the equipment that he's actually made uh, that not only for cars and uh, you probably made everything in here, go-karts to cycle cars to whatever, motorcycles. Russ has got a 79 KLX uh, 250. He's rebuilt it back here. Everything in here screams vintage. So we'll let him tell you about uh, the uh, the the industrial grade tools that he uses around here for that kind of thing. So stand by, we'll let you hear about his cars. So um, here we are down in the shop and uh, the first car we're going to look at here is my 1930 Ford Model A Coupe. It's a traditional, traditional um, style hot rod that I built back in the 90s. And um, Around that time, when the Hot Rod 50 amp came out, this amp, this car was still being built. And so there was a pretty popular poster that we had done back then. Of this car still in primer, still in a million pieces in my old shop in Van Nuys, California. And what we had done was, it was to introduce the Hot Rod series of amps. And uh, as many people that are familiar with Hot Rods know, oftentimes, You'll have custom valve covers that'll have the manufacturer's brand name on it. Like these happen to be Y end valve covers, but there's always some kind of a name usually in the valve cover. Like, you know, Chevrolet even put Corvette in the valve covers of the early VET motors. So, what we did for the photo shoot to promote the Hot Rod 50 amp was we made some Hot Rod 50 amp heads and we replaced the cylinder heads on the motor, which are these guys here for. Those of you who are non-car people, these are the cylinder heads. Anyway, we took the heads off, we put amp heads in their place, and with the Soldano logo on the top of it, it looked like a V8 engine with a pair of Soldano heads on it. And they were heads, but they were amp heads, not cylinder heads. And so we did this whole thing, and the whole theme behind it was that the Hot Rod 50 was the first amp you could buy it was hot rodded right out of the box. In other words, all the mods that you would normally send an amp to me to have done, we already built into that amp when it was new. So this car got its uh, advertising debut as the poster car for the Soldano Hot Rod 50. After that happened, I continued working on it. I finished it and got it to the point where it's an, a real driving car and it's been on the road since 1995. So, uh, the inspiration of this car came from when I was a kid. Uh, the first hot rod I ever saw was when I was probably about six years old, and that was in 1962. And the guy that worked at a gas station that my parents used to buy gas in, it was a Richfield gas station, he had a red primered um, hot rod Model A coupe. That's, I mean, at six years old, that's all I knew about it. I didn't know about what kind of motor or anything else then because I was too young. But that really was like, that really created an impression on me. And from probably age six on, I was just infatuated with cars and hot rods and stuff. So many, many years later, I'm sitting around in California, amp business going okay. And I, was, I went to look for some engine parts a guy had for sale. When I went to look at the engine parts, I happened to see that he had this Model A body, and that's how this car got started. I, I bought the body from him, also bought the engine parts he had, and I built what to me would be the quintessential, like if you were the coolest kid on the block, this is the car you would have had in 1962. So 
Uh, the motor's a 1962 Olds 394. It's got six carburetors. This would have been state-of-the-art speed equipment in 1962. Um, all of the speed parts on this car are period correct. Nothing's newer than 62. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't a few modern touches. There's a lot of, there are a lot of handmade parts that I built that are on here. Uh, the front motor mount, I machined from a solid chunk of one inch thick aircraft um, aluminum alloy. Uh, the front, the suspension, the front suspension is basically 48 Ford style. It's got 59 Buick finned aluminum brake drums, which was all the rage back in 1962. Uh, I built the headers are all custom built, and many of the brackets and components, all the throttle linkage, all this is stuff that I fabricated in my own shop. And uh, the overflow canister, you were talking I, about? Yeah, I'm, this is made sure, from yeah. an old fire extinguisher can that was heavily modified, welded on, and that created an overflow tank for the radiator. Uh, these, these headlight brackets are machined from solid chunks of billet alloy that I machined into these nicely sculpted little brackets and polished up and made them look like vintage pieces. Um, yeah, lots of, a lot of really cool custom pieces here. The rear axle is out of a 58 Oldsmobile. It's got three nine gears and a pause traction. Transmission is a Bora Warner Super T10 four speed. Oh, wow. And uh, this thing's just a ton of fun to drive. It's a, it's a lightweight car with a really big motor. Good, can, good, can you good. run 87 octane in this car? No, nah, it, it can run the mid-grade stuff like the 89, but it really is happiest on 92 octane. It's got a bit of compression. Uh, it runs with drags on street tires. It'll run 13 flat at about 102, which is not super fast, but it's because it doesn't have any traction. The slicks, are, I've never run it on the slicks of track yet, but I figured it'll, it'll go into the mid-12s probably. How's it handle at that speed through, through the Good. speed through the speed line? Yeah, you like go to the steering wheel and just go straight as an arrow. It's got a lot of caster in it, so you can just like go to the steering and down the road. So that, did you do the interior yourself, or did you have somebody no, that, help you with that? The seat was done by a local. I did carpet, which is nothing. All I did is cut out a piece of carpet and stuck it on the floor. Um, but the seat was done by a local uh, upholstery shop, and it's just a cut down Model A seat. Um, but all these aluminum brackets, like the steering column drop, the tack mount, the entire steering column, all that's custom fabricated. The brake and clutch pedals, I made all those pieces. That's all fat, custom fab stuff. It uses 44 pedal pads, the rubber pads, but the rest of it's all custom built. You know, moon gas pedal, because that would have been all the rage in 62. And... Um, now, was that done here in Seattle, or was that L.A. built? I built almost all this car in L.A. Uh, the only, I, when I got to Seattle, the only thing I finished up was the wiring and the throttle linkage. and Oh, and I guess the exhaust wasn't done yet. So when I moved back to Seattle, I, I finished the car by doing the exhaust, the throttle linkage, the wiring, and that's it. But the car was a rolling. It was a roller with a motor in it when I moved up here, and it was already painted. So did you, did you, it was a rolling chassis? You put it on a trailer? To get it up yeah, there, I brought a trailer to bring it up here. Yeah, and I fabricated the chassis too. It's a the frame rails I bought from TCI. It's a reproduction model A frame rails. But all the cross members and all the mounts, everything, the ladder bars I built all that stuff from scratch. How about the, the exhaust? Did you build that? Yeah, it's all scratch built. I rolled these cones myself. No way. Yeah. What, what's what is that? Uh, all aluminum? No, there's there's it's all steel. It they're is. they're uh, ceramic coated. So. Okay. But uh, cut out my own. You can't buy header flanges for 394 olds. This was this motor was obsolete in the early 60s. Nobody ever uses them anymore. So by 1990, there were virtually no parts available for these. So I had to cut out my own header flanges. I had to scrounge around for all the vintage speed parts. But it was you know that's half the fun of doing one of these projects. So how about the how about the chrome grill around the radiator? That's a stock Model A grill shell that I just shortened a little bit. So that's an original model. It, it just original. polished it yourself? Yeah, polished it myself. That's an original Ford Ford part. And these are original 1930 Model A headlight uh, assemblies as well. The only thing I did is put a halogen conversion in them so they're bright enough to you. So you can actually see them. So you can actually see. In the old days, they ran on six volts, and they were so dim you couldn't see anything. You know, they were a joke. They were gotcha. a joke. So, yeah.
That's, a, that's an awesome bill. This is what most people are used to seeing with the amplification side of the house, is this, uh, this purple Model A. Yeah, this one's been in some, it's been in some ads, it's been at the NAMM show, um, it's been on Christmas cards when I used to do Christmas cards, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's been seen in association with the amp biz. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. How about behind you, Mike? Yeah, I know this is a real uh, pride and joy for you here. The yeah, 66 Nova. So tell I, me I about this one. This. So when I was, when I still had the shop in, in California, this was my daily transportation. The night haul amp. I mean, it's got, per, it's the perfect size car for hauling a couple 412 speaker cabinets around in. So this was kind of my, uh, it's all dusty now. Everything down here is dirty, but um, this was my, my, daily transportation for many, many years. And uh, a few years ago, I built a uh, chassis for a, a Ford Model T Roadster. Uh, a friend of mine was building Hot Rod Roadster, a T-Bucket is what they call it. So I, we did a trade, my, body, my buddy has a body shop. He painted my car for me and trade for me fabricating him a chassis. But unfortunately, when he brought me the car back, it was still all taken apart. All he'd done is the paint. He was supposed to put it all back together. So I've been so busy building amps, I haven't had time to work on my car. So my car is sitting in my shop waiting to be reassembled. And once it is, this will be once again my daily transportation because I love this car. It's so fun. And it's, it's really practical, too. It's got space. I can haul stuff in it. And it looks really good doing it. So What's the engine? Got a, it's, it's a factory V8 car, so most of these came with six cylinders, so this has a 283 V8 in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, single four barrel, which I put on it. Um, it's power glide automatic. Uh, I'll probably just leave it that way because it's just it's reliable and it drives nice. It's not a it's no it's no road rocket, but it you know keeps up with traffic and it's it's fun to drive. So oh, that's a great car. And this yeah. is a 1966. 66, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about uh, in front of us over here? So this is my 38 Chev. This is the car I've owned the longest of all my cars. And so when I moved to LA in 87 to start sold on a custom amplification, this is the car I drove to LA. I had a 412 in the trunk. I had two SLO heads. I had all my suitcases and luggage in the front seat and in the back. And I drove from Seattle to Los Angeles. And this was, because this used to be my daily transportation in, in 87, when I started this company, this was the only car I owned. And so this, I drove this everywhere. I drove in snow, rain, sleet, you name it. It was driven. And here in Seattle, it does actually snow occasionally. And this got driven in the snow because it was the only car I owned. Where'd you find this one from? Um, I had, kind of a long story, but the, the Reader's Digest version is, when I was in high school, this was for sale in the newspaper. And I went to look at it, but I couldn't afford the $1,500 to buy it. And so about two years later, and so meanwhile, and I found a 67 Camaro that I bought for like $475. I souped it up over the years. So two years later, the Camaro is all bitching and fast. It's a mid 13 second street car. I'm, you know, blowing the doors off and just about everything on the road in the Seattle area with it. And um, I'm driving past a guy's house one day and I see this car sitting in the front yard with the rear fenders removed weeds growing up around it, and I didn't recognize it right away as mm. being the car I saw in high school. I just saw it as a 38 Chevy, and I wanted to check it out. So I went, went up to this guy's door, knocked on it. He wasn't there. He'd be there the next day. He came back the next day. Turns out, upon closer inspection, I realized it was the same car I looked at in the paper two years earlier. This guy had bought it. He let it kind of go to hell. It was just sitting in his yard because something broke, and he did not fix it. So I traded my Camaro, which was finished, painted, bitching, and beautiful for this just dilapidated 38 Chev Coupe, but I knew I wanted it because I knew how nice this car once was. Took it home, pieced it together just well enough because I just traded away my daily transportation for this. So I had to get it running again, so I'd have something to drive. So I kind of drove it sort of in a sort of Mickey Mouse manner for about a year, and then I decided it really needed to be done justice and needed a full rebuild and restoration, you know, rebuild, not, not restoration, it's a hot rod, but needed a full rebuild. So I bought a beater to get me around, daily driver, and I started rebuilding this, which took me about four years because I had no money in those days. Um, got it all running, 
what you can't tell now because this paint shot, but in 1980 when I painted this thing, it had a bitch and laughter paint job. I have pictures of it. It looked it was all hand rubbed. It looked absolutely beautiful. It's, it's, it's showing its age now because the whole time I lived in California, this thing sat outside because I didn't have indoor parking at my old shop. So the salt air, the sun, everything kind of got to it. So it's a little bit, it's looking a little bit long in the tooth now, but you know, I, I don't care. I still love it the way it is. Um, anyway, drove it for a long time in California. Finally, some bearings went out in the transmission. I parked it in my shop, started taking it apart to change the tranny. And of course, as a typical hot rod goes, you start changing one thing. You're like, hey, well, while I got it apart, I might as well take, instead of rebuilding the four speed, I'll put a five speed in it. And while I'm at it, why don't I, you know, make some suspension changes? And why don't I do this? Why don't I? So pretty soon I got the car all torn apart in a million pieces. And it kind of sat because all, then I built the purple car, you know, then I did something else and then I was moving the business back to Seattle. So this poor thing sat for many years after that. And then finally, if, uh, once I moved into this shop uh, and I had space to work on it again, I started working on it again. I built a new motor for it. It's got a really, really nice 327 in it now with Weber carbs. And uh, this thing runs like a million bucks. It's got a Richmond gear five speed behind it. Uh, I rebuilt the, again, this also has a 58 Olds rear end in it. I rebuilt the rear end again. And uh, I'm just now doing some final, final fine tuning on this combination. And it's, I'm gonna be driving daily again, like I used to. It's really a fun car. It's a gorgeous car. Yeah. And this is a 38 Chevrolet. 38 Chevy Coupe, yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's got a lot of really cool parts on it. I did, a, I did a disc brake conversion on this, again, late 70s is when I did all this initial chassis work. In the late 70s, you couldn't buy disc brake kits for 38 Chevs or any other early Chevy for that matter. So that's a... So that's my own design and fabrication there. I, I, uh, I built a, a tube front axle with 54 chef spindles, and then I machined the spindles to take 70 Camaro rotors and then 70 Camaro calipers, and I built my own disc brake conversion and uh, put disc brakes on this, and like I say, it was 1978 or 79 when I did that. Unheard of. Yeah, back then it was fairly uncommon. I mean, guys were doing it, but they were doing it like the way I was doing it. All custom built parts. Sure. Now you can buy kits to do that from Willwood. It's, it's easier. It's nice. I like, I like to be able to just dial one in and buy parts. It saves a lot of time, but nonetheless, it was fun to do. How about the rear, the rear chassis? Are those uh, are yes, they, are they, are they traction bars, bars, ladder bars? They call them slapper bars. They're just, they keep the front of the spring from wrapping up under acceleration. Oh, I see it. So I custom fabricated those. And the rear end's a 58 Olds rear end. It's got uh, 287 gears in it, which are really high gears, like they're freeway gears. But the Richmond gear five speed has a really low first gear. Oh, I see. So it actually works out really well. So the first four gears, the thing drives like a four speed with, with you know, a drag rear end in it. And then you go into fifth gear, it cruises down the freeway like it has overdrive. Oh, this is beautiful. This is great. Yeah, and, and for years it had a personalized plate that said Amp Man on it. And so oh, I yeah. used to drive around L.A. and it said Amp Man. Oh, that's great. I still have the plates that are upstairs, but now it just has a Washington collector plate. All right, awesome. Rocky, let's see. Let's take a look at the uh, the Biscayne. Yeah, so... A little history on the Biscayne over here. Well, this is just a cool car. It's a Survivor. Um, and it's, a, as you can see, it's six-cylinder powered, so... I've always liked 59 to 60 Chevys. I used to have a 60 Chev sedan delivery that was really cool, and I'd put a 350 in it. Had a, I had grafted the front suspension from a, uh, get this out of the way, from a 70, uh, 79 Camaro to it, had power steering, disc brakes. It was really cool. And it was also one of my daily transportation cars when I was in California as well. And it's actually the, the car that I delivered Mick Mars's 412 cabinets to him in. When we got it done, we built, we built the cabs. He was living in Malibu at the time, and we drove him out to his house, and we used my 60 sedan delivery to drive him out there, and he thought that was really cool because he's kind of a car guy, so he really dug that. So anyway, I like 59, 60 Chevys, and unfortunately, the sedan delivery 
got sold a few years ago because I needed to finance. Well, it got sold so I could buy that Corvette. Was, was that the red and white when that was on top that you used to have up top? It was orange. Orange color. Yeah, bright yeah, yeah. orange. Yeah. yeah, I had American mags on. I remember that. that yeah, yeah that's, you saw it before. So that was that car. Anyway, though, in the meantime, though, a friend of mine had bought this 59 Chev. And when he first got it, I was just like in love with it. It was just like, that is so nice. It was just a low mileage, original grandma car. And I have some, I have a bunch of old 409 Chevy parts around here. So back in the day, the 409 was the big hot V8 for, in uh, 62, that was the hot motor to have in a, you know. And Gary Chevy. Usher's dad wrote a song about that. Yeah. 409. Yeah, yeah 409, exactly. So it was, it was really cool. So I've got a bunch of parts to build an original dual quad 409. So my whole thing that made me so attracted to this car when my friend Dave bought it was like, that would be a perfect car to stuff a 409 or a four speed in and make a really cool early 60s style drag car, you know, hot rod, right. street, street car, but you know, drag oriented. <laughs> well, my buddy, of course, like, I'm never gonna sell this thing, it's awesome. Well, my other buddy who knew him better, who grew up with the guy, told, took me aside and goes, don't worry, he says, Dave sells everything eventually. He never keeps, he never holds on to anything. So just wait your time and eventually you'll be able to buy that car. And sure enough, about five years after he got it, Bar my friend Marshall calls me and goes, hey, Dave's selling the 59, you want it? And I'm like, yeah, I want it. And it turned out that I had some car parts that Dave actually wanted. So we ended up doing a partial trade and a little bit of cash, and I bought Dave's 59 Chev. So I ran down to Puyallup to pick it up. And, you know, and of course, I knew it had the six-cylinder and the three-speed in it. So I was like, yeah, when I get home, man, the first thing that's coming out is that motor, that 49. Well, from driving it from Puyallup to Seattle, by the time I hit Seattle, I was like, I'm not touching this car. I liked it just the way it was. It's gutless as hell, but that little six banger just purrs like a kitten. Sure. The three in the trees, a hoot to drive. And it's just a great cruiser, and it's so original. I just couldn't see myself cutting it up and doing all that stuff to well, it. So, Well, nobody's going to steal it because they have no idea what a three on the tree is. Yeah, they don't even know how to drive it. Yeah, somebody jump in there and some kid wouldn't even know how to get the thing into gear, you know. They wouldn't know what that third pedal on the floor was for. So, yeah, so I'm just leaving it the way it is. So this thing's all original. The only thing that's been done to it is somebody who had it before Dave had split the exhaust manifold so it has dual exhaust. And then my friend Dave put the American Mag wheels on, which, of course, look awesome on this car. But other than that, it's completely original. Yeah, you like those wheels. I'm seeing that on quite oh, a yeah, few cars. I'm, I'm, You're big on that. I but. really like these wheels, yeah. And, oh, it's locked. But anyway, it's... Um, and it's a Survivor. It's a Survivor. It's, 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 I actually have the original owner pack that the, that the old lady who bought it brand new in 59 oh, wow. had. And it was bought here locally. It was bought in the Seattle area, in Paulsbo, which is across the Puget Sound on... Uh, up by Brem near Bremerton. So uh, this thing is, this is an original Northwest car. It's never been hit. It's never been re repainted. All the dents you see in it are original dents. Nothing's ever been fixed. Um, it's fairly rust-free considering its age. And it has about 55,000 miles on it now, original miles. Can you imagine taking this to a body shop? They wouldn't know what to do with this rear wing. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't know what to do with it at all. So... Yeah, so it's just a cool old car. It's a survivor. So I'm just keeping it the way it is. Uh, right now I'm rebuilding the carburetor on it because the, this modern-day gas that has ethanol in it, it just it's destroy, it. eats up oh, yeah. the carburetors. Yeah. Yeah. How about the vet up there? I know you were looking for that for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I finally got one of those. So that's a 62 vet, and I've wanted a, a first-generation vet since I was probably... 16 years old, I guess, and I've never been, never could afford one, because even back in those days, like when I was in high school, you could buy one of these cars for two thousand dollars. But when I was 16, two thousand dollars might as well have been two hundred thousand oh, dollars. Couldn't come afford up, it. Couldn't afford wow. it. So over the years, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the two thousand dollar car became a ten thousand dollar car. But at that time, I couldn't afford it because all I had was five thousand. So they were always just a little bit ahead of me. And then finally, a couple of years ago, um, I had a guy make me an offer on my orange sedan delivery, so I sold that. I had a 93 vet, I sold that. I had a 67 Camaro convertible project that I'd had for 20 years yeah, and I never gotten around to. Yeah. And a guy made me a good offer on that, and I sold that. 
And so I sold all this stuff, and then I had a JTM 45 Marshall amp that I got a big chunk of cash for, sold everything, and I found this on Craigslist, and it's no cream puff. It's been hit in all four corners um, and pieced back together, but you can't really tell, you know? Somebody did a fairly decent job on it. And because it was so beat up, though, in, the tr in collector's terms, I mean, to me, it's fine, but- That's perfect. Collectors would look at that and go like, oh, we want something nicer to start with. Because of that, the price was extremely good. And for once, I was able to finally afford to buy one of these. And so I did. Yeah, it's a great car. And between the two of us, we've had five Corvettes. So that means a lot for both of us. Yeah. The, uh, C2, C3. And there's Russ. Say hello to Russ. Russ. There's Russ. Peace uh, out. He's got a question. Cut. Russ has a question about something. Oh, do you get a different size one? Yeah, so you just put a little wrench on that hex part. And you just, just yeah, so between Mike and I, we've had C2s, C3s, C4s, C5s, C6s. I uh, just missed yeah, the 53 to 55. Were there floats in the 